Well, it's great to be here um, uh, with you all. Um, these were two very sort of asymmetrical approaches to the general world of, I guess, what we could call culture. L let's start uh, quickly with the internet. Um, it certainly is a new horizon in China, and I, I, the internet seems to have broken down, as, as Guoliang has suggested, into two real main uh, areas. One is um, video, games, entertainment, and I don't know how many of you have been into internet cafes in China. It's a, it's a really terrifying prospect to walk <laughs> in the door and see rooms as big as this or bigger with people chock-a-block the whole way down. I was in one a couple of weeks ago because I wanted to send an email. I didn't see a single person in the whole place sending email or doing anything. They were all playing video games. So I think this notion of the internet as the entertainment uh, sort of hub of China, a kind of anesthetic, if you will, uh, to what I think we normally think of the internet as engendering is, is all too true. And then, of course, the other side of the internet uh, is, is a very interesting paradox because on the one hand, the internet has these uh, sort of uh, spontaneous uh, insurrectionary tendencies that we think of when we think of freedom of expression and internet use as a way to spread ideas, some of them uh, dissenting ideas. But the other side of the paradox, of course, is that the internet also serves well to uh, enable governments to become more efficient, to propagandize better, to maintain better contact with provinces, with counties, and their constituent parts. And indeed, I think it would be a um, misnomer yeah. to think of the internet as only being a force for uh, 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 dissent, which I think is an all too common misapprehension in this country. In fact, the Chinese government has used it extremely well to uh, uh, consolidate rather than uh, just watch it become a force for disunity, uh, for party building, if you will. Um, finally, I'd have to say, I think we're watching one of the great experiments of history uh, in China taking place. Uh, it's a petri dish of sorts between sort of old, the old world of communications and the new world of information technology. And what, what we're watching being acted out in a very veiled way behind the screen where we can't really see very clearly what is happening. Uh, we are seeing the old tendencies of this Leninist uh, structure that's left over from the 50s in China trying to control, as it always has, through the Department of Propaganda, through the State Office of Information, you name it, and myriad other new organs that relate to the internet. This extraordinarily new dynamic and uh, vibrant form of communication. And I would have to say in the long run they probably won't win. In the short run, I take my hat off to them. They've done a hell of a good job. <laughs> and one could go into that a little more. Uh, but still, it springs leaks everywhere. But you have to admire Chinese propensity for control that they have not just given up in abject uh, failure. They've stuck with it. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a race, as some of our major IT companies here, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, uh, they are involved in very interesting jousting matches in China to enter the market and yet not completely have their brand name sullied by the compromises which they are forced to make. Um, let me turn to, um, to Jeremy Barme, uh, always a challenge. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, Jeremy is one of the more interesting sort of uh, scholars on China uh, and has certainly had a long and, 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 and interesting career observing this amazing country. Uh, you know, when, uh, speaking of culture, when I first went to China myself in 1975, uh, it was a very different place. There was not a single billboard except ones with slogans of Chairman Mao on it. There was only one high-rise building in all of Beijing, and that was the newly built Beijing Hotel. Um, there was uh, basically, uh, no, well, there was no television. There was radio. We've come a long, long way indeed. In those days, uh, Mao Zedong's uh, Yan'an forums on art and literature were the establishing canon of what media, what culture, what <coughs> art was supposed to be all about, namely a megaphone for the party. Culture today uh, has really broken out of that containment vessel in many ways, even strangely as the old structures are still there. 
it's this, you really do need a sort of a, uh, uh, a left brain, right brain um, sense to, to understand uh, what's going on in the world of culture in China because there's so much that hasn't changed and there's so much that has changed. And I think actually culture is one of those areas that has changed uh, more, than, more than any other area. And it's very interesting. Um, one of the reasons why we find culture in China in at once such a vibrant state, but also a state of kind of uh, a gravityless state, is because China in the last hundred years has gone through a series of really remarkable cancellations. And it has left the China today and the culture we now see today in a place where it hardly knows what is its tradition and what is it that it's kicking off against? Now, the cancellations began uh, at the end of the Qing Dynasty. It fell in 1911. The old Confucian system began to be very strenuously criticized in the May 4th movement. That led into a period where we had a kind of a, a moment of synthesis between East and West with Chiang Kai-shek, a whole new uh, identity for China. Then came the communist movement when the Republican period was canceled, it was rejected, and we got a whole new sense of China as a revolutionary society and all of that, all of those values and those eth ethics. And then along comes Deng Xiaoping and cancels the revolution in large measure, at least in terms of culture, and we're speaking of culture. And then, of course, into that very curious vacuum that had been left by all these cancellations. You know, biologists speak of a phenomenon called colonization resistance, where an organism has a bacterial resistance within it against things coming in from the outside. Well, China had none. Uh, and into that came the marketplace. But also into that came a lot more freedom of every kind. And of course, that was uh, uh, the world in which culture started to develop in, in, in a very interesting way. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I went out to, um, there are all of these artists' communities now arising on the outskirts of Beijing, and indeed in other places as well. Uh, you all know about Qi Zhou Ba, the uh, uh, 768 uh, uh, arts, uh, studios and galleries, but there are others where people are acquiring these, these huge ateliers, one out in uh, Mayor Chen Shitung's old villa uh, out on the uh, outskirts of Beijing where the, there's a whole colony of 40 artists who have built uh, warehouses, built their studios, and uh, just recently were being th trying to be thrown out by the local county government which wanted to take back the land as they do from peasants often and there was a big uh, uh, to-do about it. They had a barbecue, invited all the press out, threatened to go public, exposed this uh, injustice, and they were allowed to keep their studios. But this bespeaks of a whole new independence in the world of culture. Uh, it's a very exciting world. Um, it's a curious world. Jeremy has described it in his paper as, um, he's compared it really to eating, to the sort of voracious appetite of uh, sort of devouring. Uh, and I think uh, it is an interesting metaphor. It's almost as if after all of these decades of scarcity and a kind of a cultural starvation, now that the China has been released, it isn't quite sure in which direction to go and it isn't quite sure uh, just what to, what to absorb, what to take in. And you do get this at once very wild and exciting and also incredibly indulgent, uh, over-the-top uh, uh, consumption of almost everything including culture. And the marketplace, of course, is there in very strong measure, and that, too, is influencing culture in ways that is, are quite profound. Um, I was in a photo gallery uh, with a photographer, magnum <coughs> photographer, and she was looking at the works of one photographer that were being sold for several thousand dollars. And she was quite astounded because she, a very well-known photographer in this country, uh, could hardly expect to have her photos snapped up at that rate. And so uh, something else that uh, Jeremy Barme has written about uh, over the years is the way in which culture now, uh, even though as it's being liberated, is also being pulled into a whole other field of gravity, namely the marketplace. In this sense, it, I think, is joining us. It's joining the world of culture, 
where, in effect, uh, we no longer have much of anything to push off against. Not a revolution, not a government so much, although in some cases in this country we're seeing a little more of that. But we're all out there in a kind of a common global culture. And in this sense, I think culture, to watch it, to look at painting, look at films, photography, read literature, is, is a terrific way to look into the future of China. You see harbingers of things to come because it is an area in which there is uh, greater latitude. And I wager the challenges in the future will be culture uh, struggling against the marketplace, not struggling against the government. Thank you very Thanks. much, Orville.